Uh, look, let's talk uh, the election, shall we? Because so many young people, it seems, uh, voted for reform. You care more, actually, than voted for the Tory party. According to Nigel Farage, he says that something big is happening among Gen Z voters. You're a couple of years out of being a Gen Z voter, uh, Kel yeah, Kenzie, yeah. age-wise. Yeah. Uh, but what do you think this tells us? I'm doing us, the best, though. Yeah, you've got a good moisturiser. What do you think this tells us about the votes of the young? Well, I think the first thing it tells you that uh, Farage was clever in that he spent much of his marketing money on TikTok. And anybody who knows the TikTok generation, as I do in my own household, right, I know them, I'm not part of them, as you kindly point out, <laughs> right, knows that they get everything, I mean everything, off TikTok. And if it's not on TikTok, it hasn't happened. So if, a, if an H-bomb goes off in North Korea, they will have no idea about that unless, unless TikTok carry it. So they were clever about that. I wouldn't be too buoyed up. Uh, I'd, I'd be pleased if I were uh, Farage, but I wouldn't be too buoyed up. After all, the Conservatives were unvotable for, right, even by Conservatives. And the figure that you haven't mentioned there was that the youngsters, the, that, the 18 to 30s, 18% uh, of them voted Green. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, was the biggest... I mean, if, if somebody had said to you before the election that the Greens were going to get damn near 20%, you would have said, that's out of the question. So I, if I'm Green, I'm massively buoyed up. I'm pleased if I'm reformed. But actually, that election didn't really prove anything except how disliked the Conservative Party were. Tom? That's the point, isn't it? I think it's uh, classic grievance politics. And it's not particularly new. I mean, when I was growing up in the 80s, we had Thatcher, we had a lot of youth unemployment. I was certainly not going to vote for... Uh, the Thatcher government, and it's why uh, you know I joined at the time the Labour Party, which wasn't in office; had been out of office for a long time. I've got the same, you know, I've got Gen Zers uh, in my family. Um, I shan't out anybody on 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 air in terms of how they might have voted, but uh, shall we just say, you know, uh, in parts of my family, um, Nigel Farage, you know, he's uh, he's a hero uh, in terms of the language that he speaks about some of the problems that this country faces. And that's why I say about in some ways this is not new. You know, anti-establishment parties or the anti-establishment point of view is always attractive to young people, certainly attractive uh, to me. But perhaps more importantly, you know, look at how powerful that grievance narrative is. I mean, if you're young now, uh, if you're below the age of 30, uh, you're very unlikely to get on the housing ladder. So the dream of home ownership's gone. You know, when I was growing no, no, up, no. I was the first in my family. You can come back in a minute, Calvin. Yeah. I was the first in my family you to tell go. You Tom. There yeah, you go. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've learned from bitter experience, Michelle. Um, but I was the first in my family to go to university. Now, that worked out extremely well because it was the dream of get a good education and you'll get a good, well paid job. That bargain, that opportunity bargain, is now gone in our society. So I'm not surprised uh, Gen Z you know, are looking at that narrative and saying, why would on earth would I vote for parties that have been a part of creating that narrative over the last 20 or 30 years? Well, on, on the question of the home ownership aspect, of course, everybody's... The ability to buy a home has not... It does not exist in the same way as it did for 18 to 30s. Why? Because your life changes don't start until you're 30 odd. No. Women and men are getting married at, at that time and then when they get to 30, a couple of years, and then they have thinking of having children or whatever, and then they're yep. buying. So the biggest percentage jump yep. in home ownership, right, in history now belongs to the 35 to 45s. And that is what's happening. People are renting homes for longer and they're settling down later in their life and they're having children much later yeah. in their life. Karen, I just don't buy all of that analysis. Right. I'll tell you why. Right. Tell... We'll, we'll just no, look at the no, stats, no, Tom. No, it would no, be I much have, easier actually, to talk you know about I the have, economy. This is something I have looked at the stats on. And whilst, you know, I'll give you something. On the demographics, people are generally, which is a problem, by the way, for this country, people are settling down much later than they were. Well, take, take Michelle. Uh, She's an example. Yeah, but let's... <laughs> she settled down at 50. Thank yeah. you. Now, now, he's throw, now he's a throw in a curveball to true, try and put me off. And that's not true, by the way, in case was wondering, I am still 21, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Carry on. But let, talking of the stats, let's go back to the time when uh, you were the famous editor of that Red Top yep. Sun. Very in famous. The, in the 1980s, it took, on average, a couple, saving for a, a home, 
three bedroom, two bedroom home about 19 months in terms of their average earnings if they were both saving for a deposit to get on the housing ladder. It didn't matter whether they were in their early 20s or in their early 30s, it took about 19 months to do that. Now, certainly in parts of London, the same couple on average earnings, it would take 20 odd years. They shouldn't so, try and live in London. So, it's ridiculous. Well, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm using London to live in London. I'm I just, can't afford to live in London. Anywhere in the not country. Not GB's money. But the point is, two years saving for a deposit, Calvin. Uh, you know, your generation, you did well out of that, uh, and 20 years uh, today. That's why people can't fulfil that dream, as I say, of home ownership. It's gone. No, the, 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 the parents are all chipping in, which never happened in my Bank generation. of mum and dad, if you've got it. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean... If you haven't got a mum and dad, then I'm feel sorry for you. Yeah, but a lot of people have got a mum and dad, but their mum and dad don't have any money yeah, they, uh, to they pass do have, stuff they down They do have money, them. yes. Mm. They're being very generous, and actually most of the home ownership is now being funded. Mm. Uh, in terms of deposits by, by the mum and dad, and, and many of the people watching tonight will actually have done exactly yeah. that. And, and, and everybody, and I'm not talking about the wealthy, I'm talking about people whose house prices have gone up and then they remortgage slightly in mm. order to give 20 grand, mm. 10 grand, or whatever. Do you know what I'd like to see? I think if you can afford to pay rent and you've got a good credit record, I think a lot of uh, agencies now report mm. people's. Uh, um, rent to to the credit reference agencies. I think if you can afford to rent, and mm. rents are very high now, mm. you should be able to get 100% mortgage but from the, the bank. And I think the government should underwrite the, the 5% or the, the 10% the Germans, deposit. As long as you you can afford to pay the rent, you should be able to afford to buy a house. Okay, so the but Germans have always taken this view, and they have they used to view Britons. The, uh, the British as mad for beggaring themselves literally for 20 years in order to pay, whereas they they allowed their their spare money because their rents weren't as high to actually um, to actually uh, go out and enjoy themselves. They, you, they used to laugh at us. Yeah. Have you forgotten what actually happened uh, in the financial crash? I mean, you're t you're saying you're advocating for people uh, to borrow a hundred percent of asset value. Mm. Um, what happens when things go wrong? And then you've got these kids in this situation where they've literally got nothing in their asset other than literally 100% debt. But the issue about the 2008 crash was the subprime mortgage deals. In other words, people were getting up to their neck in assets that weren't worth yeah. uh, you know, anything like what they, uh, the bank thought they did. Mm. This is why I make the connection here, Michelle, to if you can afford to pay the rent, maybe you've been paying the rent for one, two, three years, you've got a good credit record, you're in work, right? So it's, a, it's the same mortgage test that anybody would go. Because I put this to you. Frankly, paying a mortgage for most people, the bank's the landlord. Yeah. I mean, if you stop paying the mortgage, the bank will come in and repossess the home. Mm. Likewise, if you're paying the rent and you stop paying, you'll get Section 21 no, notice and you'll be out within eight there weeks. There is no Section 21. They're well, the government's that. changing. Yeah, they're trying to get rid of Section 21. But you'll be, you'll be evicted. Yeah. Right, you're right. But first of all, banks are trying very hard not to kick anybody out because once they put that debt on their, on, their, on their balance sheet, then that looks bad for them. And the truth about the matter is, the great thing about the home, although I accept mm. that the bank is the landlord, is that you, you can close the door and you don't have to worry about about your uh, about whether the about landlord is going, going, going to school, be kicked you know, out. I mean, exactly. So I, I am massively I'm massively in favour, and everybody is massively in favour of owning your own home. It turns mm. out to be a very secure investment, even if you. Even if you only look at it, like, I'm going to do 20 years, and at the end of it, it hasn't gone up at all, but at the end of it, yeah. that is 20 years of saving, which yeah. I would not make if I exactly. were... Exactly. It's a, kept a roof over your head, and if you downsize, it's part of your pension pot when you get older. Yeah. But just coming back to reform, because that's what this yeah. uh, but topic was about. But let me just put, make one more point on yeah. housing. You yeah. talk about TikTok and stuff. One of the things that I'm seeing happening a lot uh, are people on TikTok, social media, youngish uh, circle well, that would regard themselves as influencers uh, that are leading people down this path of there's huge contractors at the moment, the likes of Serco and people like that. Mm. Um, these companies are rocking up to a variety of different towns and cities. They're putting events on and they're essentially saying to people, um, you know, land Landlords in this um, city, in this town, we will give you a contract, and it is incredibly attractive financially. We will give you these rental contracts where the landlord is us, the likes of Serco. Uh, mm. They'll place asylum seekers in these properties. They will guarantee rents. They will take care of the maintenance. They're paying very decent rents. You've got no void periods, and people are going for it. A lot of people are creating HMOs, houses of multiple mm. occupancy. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they're taking a terrace house that was designed for a family or whatever. They're shoving it 
it full uh, of these adults. And I understand why people are doing it, because they're motivated by financial greed for themselves. But nobody is uh, pressing pause, thinking about the effect of what they're doing on those local communities, because I bet my bottom dollar yeah. uh, those people on TikTok, they're not doing it in their streets. Oh, no. They'll be sticking them up north in some random town and city. Hull. Yeah, in places like Hull. Yeah. So I think that needs a lot more attention and focus, because it removes um, houses away and off the market from locals that would want to buy them. It's putting huge strains uh, on the local amenities, because you're now shoving multiple people mm. uh, in these houses that were never designed for that yeah. at all. So I think that is not getting uh, explored enough at all, and I would but, say but this to is any our, of them... This is one of the problems about mass, mass, uh, mass migration, isn't it? We well, are seeing it, and it I is... I wonder an... when we segue to that, Kelvin. No, no, it's... but it's a, it's a point it's made true. by Michelle. It, well, it is an issue but, yeah. that you're living, in an, you're living in a quite poor northern town where properties are very cheap and therefore the conversion price is very cheap. You're paying 90000 for a house, you're spending 30 grand on doing it up, and unbelievably you're getting a return of 12 or 15%. So you yeah. can't blame people for doing it. So the only way to stop all this is actually turn the boats back in some form or I another, think, which think is the can... reason why reform are doing so well at the moment, because nobody else... I see the two can happen now. The Tories now are saying, oh, right, we're heading mm. towards you. Right? But they I think want you ECH can blame people it. for that. I think you can blame people for that. I'm a businesswoman. Um, I'm motivated by profit, I'm not going to lie. But I would never get into one of those situations because I think that morally it is wrong to be transforming these communities in that way. I think it's absolutely mm. wrong. And I think anyone that's doing it, you know, great. You might think you're the big I am on your TikToks, flashing your uh, cars or whatever, but you should actually be looking inwards and asking yourself, are you having a positive effect on communities? Because I would put to you that absolutely, absolutely, no, you are not. 